I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. In a move universally derided in world capitals, President Trump veered the United States in the direction of xenophobia, nativism, isolation with his decision to withdraw from the Paris Accord. But in doing so, the Trump administration appealed to his hardline Breitbart reading base and also doubled down on its rhetoric of populism a disdain for cosmopolitanism, vouching for Pittsburgh and not Paris, even as his billionaire cabinet rules the day. It's this paradox of populism, in fact grounded in a crude exploitation of the worker, a cult-like emotional connection that ignores the reality of policies and their consequences for America. That's so concerning today. That's why I invited here the mayor of Rust, John Fetterman of Braddock, Pennsylvania, on the outskirts of Pittsburgh, an edgy and brave new thinker whose service has inspired revival in the heartland. Facing off against the establishment Democratic candidates in 2016, Fetterman unsuccessfully sought the Senate nomination in a three-person competitive race. Donald Trump has mined the dark side of populism, and Bernie Sanders has mined the aspirational side. But it's that that's the common thread Fetterman re reflected last year and I welcome the mayor today. It's great to be here. Thank you for being here. It, it is that paradox of, of populism today sure. that the most visible embodiment of it is denying people a, li a living wage. Sure, yeah. I, yeah. It, uh, uh, cruelty is the new black uh, in a lot of conservative circles. And, and uh, the, the Ossoff race in Atlanta uh, area, the... Um, the GOP candidate was quoted saying, I, I don't believe in a living wage. And it's, it's staggering in its, in its nonchalance, basically. Um, and, and from my perspective, you know, the message that I tried in, in my election was, is that we're all better off when we're all better off. And uh, you can't, you know, when I, I would ask folks, you know, can you raise a family, support yourself on $9 an hour? I've never had anyone raise their hand. Um, and I don't know why that's a controversial or you know, leftist kind of concept. This idea that if you work hard and work 40 hours a week that you, you know, should be able to take care of yourself and yours. I think so too. And the first thing I wanted to mention in our discussion was just the chickens coming home to roost and boy do they have avian mm -hmm. influenza here in sure. Kansas. The, the reality being austerity, a scorched earth yep. torching of the public education system is an example of, uh, as you say, an aw shucks, nonchalance, tax cuts yep. are going to raise the standard of living, are going to improve people's lives. And in Kansas, what's the matter with Kansas? Well, they're bankrupt and they're bankrupting their children. And to me, that's, that's a, a great starting point for you as a mayor yep. or for a new populist wave to take shape. I don't know if you see it that yeah, well, way. Well, I mean, and it's interesting how Kansas is reversing those, the override road is veto. Um, and this idea that um, you can tax cut for the rich your way to prosperity has been disproven over and over again. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's the Lucy and the football, you know, and, and Charlie Brown, they keep bringing it back, hoping that it's gonna work this time. And time and time again, it's proven that it doesn't work. And I return back to this, that axiom of, we're all better off when we're all better off. And it, it's like, we're not, it's, we're still paying for it as a society. If we shortchange our children, if we don't have universal pre-K, if we pay eight, $9 an hour, you know, you're going to pay, you know, for food stamps, you're going to pay more in, in housing, you're going to pay more in um, uh, correctional costs down the road. It, it, uh, it, there's no cheap way to run, you know, this, uh, g this government. And the way that is the most inclusive, the way that um, creates the greatest benefit has been proven to show that, again, we're all better off when we were all made better off. Right. And y you were describing for our viewers, the background here is that a two-term governor decided to tax cut his way to prosperity, except yeah. it was to depression. And 
the Republican legislature has now yeah, it, was so, it was so bad, it, you know, they, they actually voted to override ride that. And that's, that's a staggering statement. And it comes as a surprise to nobody because they were constantly warned throughout the, his, his tenure that this isn't working, the deficits are increasing. It, it just, um, uh, it, they had plenty of time to avert that iceberg. Um, but, but that's where they're at. And it's, it's another lesson that I hope you know, will be embraced uh, on the right, but I, I don't have a lot of confidence that ultimately it will. Well, when you take, if you do, and I'm sure you fly out of Pittsburgh sometimes, but when you take that regional Amtrak from Penn Station to Pittsburgh and you basically go from Philly through the state mm -hmm. and, and you see um, the blue collar voter, you, yep. you see the everyday American in any variety of professions, not necessarily Minor, miners, um, these are workers of all colors and creeds. When, when you take that ride now, wh what are you thinking about? I, I'm just thinking about how um, that, you know, we in Pennsylvania um, are, are at a real critical tipping point in, in, in our state. Um, you know, we went red for the first time since 1988. And we went red because a lot of long-term Democratic voters finally in areas outside of my community in Western Pennsylvania said, hey, you know, why not give this guy a try? Um, I, I was uh, actually at his rally in Western Pennsylvania in a small steel town called Manesson last, well, actually almost a, month, a year ago to the day. And here is Donald Trump in a depressed steel town struggling for its very survival. And they're cheering for a billionaire you know, that um, purchases Chinese steel, that stiffs his contractors. And, and it, it struck me just, I said either he's lost it or he, you know, has figured something out that we don't fully yet realize. And I look at that as the turning point in the 2016 election where, um, I don't know if it was analytics or, or just instinct, but they were able to carve a path by bringing in disaffected Democrats that have watched their way of life and their community and, and, um, and their, their, their social welfare just uh, erode over the last 30 or 40 years. And they decided to take a chance on somebody like Donald Trump. It doesn't seem to me, not to be too hopeless, that there is any accountability from those voters who see the appointment, as I said in the intro, of a billionaire cabinet yeah. and policies that ostensibly are not going to be beneficial. So, so what's the way forward? The, the way forward for the Democrats, you know, in my in my own humble estimation, is and for Americans. Well, I mean, I mean, right? it. it you know, I don't think anything's going to change much in the 2018 election. Um, and when I was campaigning as a surrogate for, for Hillary Clinton and, and also uh, Katie McGinty, um, I, I was just warning people like, look, you can't let this happen because you're going to they're going to run the table if you let Donald Trump uh, sneak in. And you already have a Supreme Court justice appointed and you're probably going to have one more. And that alone will shape the con a conservative agenda throughout America for the next 30 years. You know, we as Democrats have to focus on getting 2020 and we have to heal the rift, I believe, that exists strongly between S Clinton and Sanders camp and also a new emerging rift where do we make a sustained outreach to disaffected Democrats and Trump voters or do we just say, you know, that's treason, it's unforgivable, we're going to write you off, we're going to find a new path. And I'm for the former, of course. Um, and until we do, we run the risk of becoming disorganized and, and kind of going after our own and the purity test um, that could conceivably give him four more years. Why do you have so seemingly little faith in 2018? Um, I, I, I just get the sense that, um, I, of course, there could be some Russian bombshell or some kind of uh, thing of that nature, but uh, people are, are clamoring uh, on, on the left for impeachment, impeachment. It's like, well, then that just gets Mike Pence, okay? And Mike Pence is the, you know, conservative, organized, I mean, like, in fact, in some ways, you know, he's, you know, the GOP's ideal standard bearer. So this notion that we can, um, you know, take everything back in 2018, if Trump is impeached or what have you, I, I think is, is uh, just flat out wrong. But what is your experience in Braddock, how does that inform the way you appeal to the 
not the dark side of populism, mm -hmm. but, but the better angels of populism, sure. the humanitarian potential sure. of populism. Well, I, I, I've always tried to live in, in an authentic manner. Um, and you take, uh, you know, whatever, whatever um, topic it is, say living wage. It's like, I have, you know, I got my start teaching uh, helping young people get their GEDs. And I know firsthand what a job making $15 an hour can do for a family. And when you actually talk to people one-on-one -on -one and say, um, you know, do you really think it's fair to pay somebody $8.50 an hour that works 40 hours and they still live in poverty? And, and you know, they, they'll admit it. There's too much tribalism when it comes to that. Same with uh, immigration. My wife um, was, was a dreamer. You know, she came from Brazil. And this idea that we're going to, uh, you know, like she has made this world such a better place. And when they meet her, it's, you know, oh, that, I didn't mean, uh, really, that's what immigrants are really like? So this, uh, you know, demonstrating that, um, you know, we're, we're living through an authentic, um, uh, you know, this is our lives. You know, my wife is a dreamer. We live in one of the poorest communities in, in, in the state, and we, we want to move the community and the region um, forward in a way that is conducive to everyone's welfare, not this idea that we're going to uh, uh, be able to tax cut our way, you know, to the 1%. How did you find that message in the neighborhoods surrounding Braddock and across Pennsylvania? How did you find it to resonate or not resonate in what, what was a very polarized moment? Sure, it was incredibly polarizing. And, and uh, you know, I would, uh, you know, I was a surrogate and I would go to these events and I would talk to union presidents and, and, and they were sweating it. They were like, you know, we're, we're fully behind Secretary Clinton, but it's like, you know, two thirds of our, our people are gonna, are voting for Donald Trump. And it's, it was an extraordinary moment that happened in American politics. They found a way where they, nobody thought that there was a path. And we as Democrats have to get that back. We have to do a better job. And, and I hate to say this, but in some cases I would never consider voting for Donald Trump. And I find a lot of his policies abhorrent, but we have let vast swaths of Pennsylvania and Ohio down and are they're desperate and right. we we helped foment the level of of desperation and economic insecurity we've played a role in that so you know we have to take some ownership in that as well too and from a moral and social justice standpoint you know we have to invest in these kind of places and that's consistently been my message it's not about Braddock it's not about me it's about you know this whole roster of communities in my state and, and in Ohio that need this kind of reinvestment that need this kind of attention and without it what's it going to look like 10 years from now 15 years 20 years from now um, and and I see people disparaging or making fun of uh, making light of the coal industry and it's like coal isn't a growth industry I mean I understand that but it helped build the United States it still powers uh, a lot of our electrical grid and and we have to understand these communities that's all they have and if you say, well, Arby's has more employees than the coal industry, like was reported in the Washington Post, you, you know, like Democrats gleefully proclaiming that coal's demise isn't a way to win back, you know, middle America that way. It's, it's we want to reinvest in you. We want to make sure your communities are better off. We want to, we will understand that we have to do better for you instead of just proclaiming that you guys are, are over and it's like, good luck with that. The, the infusion or the, the so-called infusion of um, coal and related energy jobs, that's, that's been grossly exaggerated, the extent to which Trump's election has fostered a new wave of economic revival. Mm -hmm. And I'm not purporting to know or suggest, Mayor, that green jobs are the answer in these communities, but... Well, they're not this. They're not the answer. The answer is is we want to reinvest in these places. We want to make sure right. these folks have basic resources. Otherwise, you've seen the unraveling that occurs. Whether it's the opioid crisis, whether it's you know my community lost ninety percent of its population. Um, you know these are s significant and staggering. Um, you know, social problems that are occurring all across, you know, Western Pennsylvania and throughout Ohio. And up until 2016, a lot of these, uh, it wasn't brought front and center. And Trump's ascension has brought a lot of this idea that it's like, wow, you know, uh, you know, what, what did we miss here? And why did these good people decide to vote for a guy that goes home and uses a solid gold toilet that pretends to be for the working families? Right. When is enough enough for small town America to recognize um, that, yes, the Democrats have just as much failed them in many instances mm -hmm. 
including President Obama, use the word security, economic security. Yep. The question of that is really that was not secured. Economic stability in the wake of the recession might have been secured through the Obama presidency, but the Obama presidency did not radically alter the socioeconomic landscape enough for people to feel like they were now mm -hmm. part of the equation. So my question is, looking to 2018 and 2020, if there is no major revival or refurbished airports, infrastructure, roads, won't there be a recognition that this was just all a hoax? You mean the, the, the Donald, Donald, Trump. Donald yeah, yeah. Trump's, when he would say, were broken, and in many instances was right about infrastructure, mm -hmm. if folks in, in Braddock and across suburban and rural Pennsylvania see it's same old, same old, it's sure. not touching me, won't, won't there be a recognition that this was just and a rejection of Trump and, and I, I, is I, that plausible? I, I don't I don't I don't necessarily see that. You know, uh, um, after he withdrew from Paris, uh, there was you know wholesale outrage on the left, and and my position was I mean like it, it, this wasn't like from a tortured, fevered brow he came. It's just like this was politics. This was 2020. This is I mean like Ohio and Pennsylvania I consider are the boardwalk and park place of of uh, American politics. You can win Monopoly without those two, but it's a heck of a <laughs> lot harder. And I, no one predicts Ohio's coming back. So Pennsylvania is an incredibly important state, and it's no accident that um, a lot of the things that he's doing and saying play well to his base. And, um, and this idea that um, that he wants to be a consensus. You know, Trump didn't run to the center. He ran to his base. And, uh, you know, there aren't Democrats now that are thinking, hmm, you know, I, I didn't vote for him in 2016, but I want to give him a try. He's, he's only getting more and more attractive to his base and less and less attractive to the people that already voted for other candidates. So, or might not have voted at or all. Or might not have voted at all. Yeah. So whether Trump has a path or not to 2020, nobody knows. That's a lifetime away. But... If he does have a path, it's going to run through Ohio and Pennsylvania for sure. And, and he's going to do everything he can to preserve that. And the people in those communities um, that voted for him, I, I think, at least thus far, I mean, we're only five months into it, thus far are not shaken of their support and, and belief that Donald... Like, there was a, a sign in Trump country that we pass all the time saying, you know, 2017, Donald Trump kicking ASS, not kissing and, and there's that sense that there's still a lot of yard signs. There's still a lot of support. And, and uh, I mean, theoretically, anything's possible. But um, uh, his constituency in western Pennsylvania is not up in arms right now saying, oh, my God, what have we done? It's, you know, you, know, you go get him, you know. And that is partly the choreography of the D.C. Exactly, swamp. Yeah. In, in, it's in, all professional wrestling. Right. You know. When I ask you before, how the, what's the way forward? I mean, it, to what extent was this racialized? To what extent was it cultural? And to what extent does it matter if you if you make if you create a local airport or improve a, sure. a road or bridge, or, or if if people aren't going to respond to that, they're yeah. going to stay in their shells. Sure. Well, I mean, um, I, I think the way the way forward is we do need to in, uh, invest in our infrastructure, but but we need structural things to happen in our economy, like a living wage, for example, and that we're going to reinvest in these aging and uh, uh, distressed communities like my own, like Youngstown, like all these other places. Um, and Have you seen signs of that happening since well, Trump's election? I haven't, and and uh, and his budget talks about cutting back the community development block grants, which is the lifeblood of communities like mine where, where private dollars will only follow public dollars. So he hasn't taken any concrete steps with the exception of killing uh, the TPP um, to uh, warrant any kind of enthusiasm or, wow, this guy really is going to be looking out for us. Um, and not that I ever expected that, but um, I, I think moving forward, um, it's, it's going to come down to uh, a lot of show, like I'm going to pretend I saved a thousand jobs at Carrier. I mean, you know, look, read Drudge Report every day, and that's what his supporters are thinking because that's where most of those uh, supporters, you know, get their source. Know what uh, you know the Democrats think. You know, we're in a Huff Post Drudge world, and we don't get out of our silos. And uh, that's a criticism as the left as as much as it is of the right. And you know, 
uh, you know, if you're, you know, barely getting by and you're having trouble at home and, you know, your kids aren't doing well at school, you, know, you, you don't sit down at your kitchen table and evaluate, you know, you know, infrastructure versus, you know, how much does racial resentment play into it? It's just <laughs> this visceral reaction you get watching the news, you know, going online. And it's, it's, it's hard to quantify. And, um, you know, it's always played a role in, in, in Republican politics. But in, in this particular case, you know, something really unique happened. And we as Democrats have to understand that. And, and we can never let it happen again. And if we do, we only ultimately have ourselves to blame for it. You've been mayor since 2006. You were recently reelected. What is your vision in this environment where mayors and county executives really have to take charge sure. with an austerity budget that may replicate the Kansas experience on a mm -hmm. national scale? Sure. Well, our, our way forward has always been what it, it always has been, is that we, we are building ourselves back from the brink. And 12 years into this, you know, we have some, some momentum. But if you drove through Braddock, you know, this afternoon, you would still see a community steeped in uh, still a lot of issues. And, and it certainly will need to go on long after I'm gone uh, to, to, to do that. And those, there are so many communities like that in my state. And, and that's a big reason why I ran. And, and if we don't get serious about reinvesting in our communities and our infrastructure and making sure that if you are working, you can support your family in a dignified manner, if we don't invest in education, um, early childhood education, health care, these kind of things, um, the, the fabric's going to continue to, to, to tear and um, uh, Pennsylvania is going to continue to accrue this, this growing roster of communities that are in trouble. What has improved since 06 and what work remains? Well, uh, you know, most every metrics improved in my community in 2006. And we're, we're waiting now to hear if we got a, a medical marijuana growing facility um, in, uh, in our community. And that would be a real game changer. Uh, medical marijuana has only recently gone legal in our state. So we put in an application for that. That would be significant. Um, we were coming back from not even having a restaurant in our community to now we will have three before the summer is out uh, open. So, you know, we're building back from a very fundamental level of, of near um, extinction. Um, and you have other communities, you know, uh, falling behind. So um, Trump would have his work cut out for him um, in Western Pennsylvania or in Ohio if he were earnest about that. And speaking as someone who's been on that ground now in there for 16 years, it's gonna take more than speeches. It's gonna take more than empty um, uh, symbolism. It's going to take uh, sustained decades of work. And I don't see it coming. Uh, and hopefully we Democrats can understand that this, we can never let this happen again. And, and we need to claim those places because that's what Democrats do. We care about and we take care of uh, places like Braddock, places like Manesson, places like Sharon, Pennsylvania, that have truly been left out of, of, of the economic equation. During the 2016 cycle, your governor was missing in action. I, I couldn't find him. I, I didn't see him out there or aware of the seriousness of the political problem. This is a Democrat mm -hmm. uh, of, of Governor Wolf, right? Uh, yeah. Who, like Kate McGinty, who ran for the mm -hmm. Senate and lost... Uh, made out of establishment cloth um, from a fiduciary treasury background. Are they doing anything to help you? Uh, G Governor Wolf, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Governor Wolf. Yeah. Uh, and I tell people right now that ask me, what can I do for 2018? What can I do is, is you should do everything you can to get Governor Wolf and Senator Casey elected. Because if Governor Wolf loses, we in Pennsylvania have an exact replica of what the federal government looks like now. A, a, a Republican chief executive, both houses, and they can run the table on all kinds of things from women's choice to environmental regulation. So, um, uh, and so that goes with, with Senator Casey. So. Um, you know, we have to hold the line in 2018, I think, in Pennsylvania, and for 2020, uh, do everything we can to turn Pennsylvania blue again. And I'm optimistic, but um, only if we incorporate the lessons that we should have learned from 2016 and we select a candidate, whoever it may be, that understands that we need to call the best uh, from the, the, the Sanders populism, but also from the uh, you know, let's, we have to win too, um, and combine them, uh, into, um, and, the, and there's the argument that Sanders would have won. I mean, that 
he got a bad rap and, and because of his provincial appeal as a mm -hmm. curmudgeonly sure. New Englander. Well, I mean, his authenticity it, it, could it, have yeah, he, it, and, won the and day. He, he had authenticity for sure. Um, but I, I bristle just a little bit because uh, Secretary Clinton pulled ahead uh, an insurmountable lead largely based on the strength of African-American vote in the southern states during the primary as well, too. So I, And then it didn't come out in the general. Yeah, and well, unfortunately, it did, didn't at the same level for Barack Obama. But, but um, you know, I don't want to re-litigate re the election. All I know is that moving forward, um, uh, you know, we need to, to have a, an inspiring level of populism and, and really, I don't see that happening in the way it should until, you know, we get Citizens United out of the picture. Right. Well, Mayor, we really appreciate your time. I, I don't want to relitigate the past so much as to <laughs> recognize that in the one primary contest to date in New Jersey, of course, you have these special congressional mm -hmm. elections. It doesn't look like the Democrats did learn their lesson. Nope. And, and, I, and I would just like to see, I would just like to see our party really come together and, and, and learn its lessons. And, and I don't see that uh, happening. And I see o uh, an overemphasis placed on these niche races in Montana and, and Atlanta. You know, if John Ossoff wins, and I sure hope he does, it's not going to change anything. If he loses, it's still, it's not, it still doesn't say anything either. It just says that we, they have spent unholy sums of money, unhealthy sums of money, on a race that's the most expensive in congressional history after participating, as I did, in the most expensive Senate race in U.S. history. And, uh, you know, money um, and unlimited money seems to be what everybody um, acknowledges uh, is the key to winning elections, and it's not. It's ideas, and I think it's authenticity, and we need to re re return to those roots. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Yes, ideas. And until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.